The price of Bitcoin is recovering pretty nicely right now, but there's really not much going on in the news. However, there is something that I've been meaning to get off of my chest, and now that there's a lot of new people entering the market, I think the time has come for me to tell you what nobody else will. You may have seen this video that's been going viral of Jared Bernstein, the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, and that's the main agency advising Biden on economic policy, according to this post by Arnaud Bertrand. But just in case you haven't seen the clip, I'm going to play it for you real quick. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? Actually, that's why we are bankrupt, but I'll let him go on. I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why do we borrow our own currency in the first place? Why, why does the government borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets some of the language that the MM, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money and it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Is that what they do? They, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds, right? Because they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I don't, I can't really talk. I, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about. Like, cause it's like the government clearly prints money. It does it all the time and it clearly borrows. Otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So I don't think there's anything confusing there. All right. So either he had a brain fart or he doesn't really know what the hell is going on. For one thing, the government isn't supposed to actually be the one printing money. It's supposed to be the Fed and they're not supposed to be a government entity. They're a private bank, supposedly. They're supposed to work independently and not be influenced by politics, but we all can tell that obviously they are. This post by Object Zero in the comments under this post explained it pretty well, but it's a little bit long of an explanation, so I'll just paraphrase it for you. They said, first of all, the government sets a budget, and then it collects taxes to pay for that spending. But whenever it doesn't collect enough taxes to cover the spending, which obviously it never does, then that's going to be a deficit. This is why the deficit continues to climb and they continue to try to raise taxes. But whenever the taxes that they pull in don't cover the fiscal spending that the government is doing, then they have to issue bonds and anybody around the world, even you or your pension fund or anybody, can just go buy those bonds and that's lending money to the government. Whenever no one wants to buy those bonds, then the Fed adds them to their balance sheet, and this is how we get inflation. It says they borrow not by going to a bank or getting a loan like you or I, but they write IOUs and they sell them to anybody. These are what the IOUs are as the bonds, and for you to take that risk, you get a little bit of an interest rate. And they call this the safest investment in the world because even if the government didn't really have the money to pay you back, they can just print some more and then pay you back that. But what is that money going to be actually worth whenever you get it? It goes on to say that the government deficits are so out of control that there aren't enough buyers in the whole world to buy those IOUs. And when that happens, the Fed must print a bunch of money out of thin air, and that's when they add it to their balance sheet, basically. But what's really messed up is that as it goes on to say, the Federal Reserve sets the payout rate or the interest rate so they actually get to decide how much they're going to pay you back for the risk you're taking and how much risk they're eventually going to put you through. It says the payout on these government IOUs sets the interest rates on every loan in the economy because no one will loan you and I the money if they can't buy government IOUs that pay out more. Because basically, why would they take on more risk by lending to you whenever they could take a risk-free investment and lend straight to the government? And the government has the power to seize citizen stuff in form of taxes to pay back those IOUs. The post says, so because governments can tax more or take their stuff, take people's stuff, governments can actually borrow more cheaply than anyone else. And the thing is, it's not just taxes as far as what you pay at the end of the year or what they take out of your paycheck or whatever. It's actually inflation, which is because of them printing this money, and that is a form of tax. So not only can they just seize your assets or something if they really wanted to, they can also just print the money, which is taking the money 
by devaluing it out of your bank account and then putting the value wherever the heck they want to. This is why a cryptocurrency is so valuable because it actually lets you escape this system, but holding your own cryptocurrency can actually be very dangerous. The reality of holding your own cryptocurrency in cold storage or holding it in self-custody as a lot of people advocate for is that you are actually being your own bank. Here's an article about somebody who just got ripped off for $20,000 whenever they went to a hotel in Manhattan to supposedly buy some cryptocurrency straight from somebody that they met online, I guess. The guy turned out to be a robber and they pushed him into the hotel room where there was two guys waiting to beat him up and they hogtied him and basically kidnapped him, leaving him in the room for the maid to find while they took his $20,000 in cash and ran away. Now the police are spreading their pictures around right here, you can see them, and they're asking for any help because obviously these guys did get away and the New York police is pretty freaking useless, so they're probably not even going to find these guys. And with a bank, if somebody gets a hold of your information and they steal some money from your bank account using your card number fraudulently, then you can usually call the bank and they'll just basically nullify those transactions and give you the money back in your account. But that's not really possible with cryptocurrency, especially if you hold your own crypto, because it's basically the equivalent of holding cash. If somebody steals the cash out of your hands or out of your wallet, comes into your home and takes it out of your safe, well, there's no insurance and there's no way you're going to get that stuff back. But these banks actually have FDIC insurance, and that's something that the crypto bros usually don't want to talk about. I personally do like to keep custody of my own cryptocurrency, but I don't keep custody of all of my crypto because if something happens, maybe I need to have a little bit of backup funds. This is the same reason why people keep money in the bank, because if somebody comes and robs them at home, well, then they're going to have some more money that's in the bank so that they can continue to live their lives. Most people these days don't actually keep any money at home, but that's really how banking started out. You may have heard people talking about or seen it posted on X that somebody recently just lost $69 million by sending it to the wrong address accidentally. And there are a lot of scams that happen in the crypto space, like people looking at the addresses that your wallet has actually interacted with and getting an address that's really close to the ones that you've interacted with in the past so that you'll go in and see something that looks kind of familiar and just copy and paste it and send the address a whole bunch of money thinking that it's the wallet that you already interacted with in the past and f verified that it was good, but it turns out that it was actually just a scammer that had a similar looking wallet who sent you like a microtransaction that you didn't even notice. This is probably what actually happened to this guy, and I guess they call these an address poisoning scam. And these are the kinds of security issues that banks pretty much have to deal with on a daily basis. It's not the same because it's not cryptocurrency, but they have their own breed of this thing. But if you actually hold your own cryptocurrency, like I said a while ago, you are your own bank, so you're the front lines. You're going to actually have to deal with this stuff, and you're going to have to be, be very vigilant. Even if you do keep your keys in a very secret location, away from the internet, and never having it even be shown on a device that's connected to the internet, and even if you never give any permissions to anybody to do anything with your crypto, even if it's just sitting in a safe somewhere, not being touched and you're just waiting on it. Somebody can still come in and do what we call in the crypto space a wrench attack. This is basically where they hit you in the head with a wrench until you tell them what the key phrases are or until they knock you out so that they can go rummaging through your paperwork and find it. And then obviously if they have your keys then they're just going to clean you out before you even wake up. Banks have security guards and police to protect them and stuff like that. That patrol the area and keep an eye on banks and watch out for criminal activity. But if you're your own bank, then you have to be your own security guard and you probably got to be your own police as well. You may have heard of the North Hollywood shootout that happened in 97, which was actually these two guys robbing a Bank of America. And they went in with bigger guns than what the cops were carrying at the time because the cops were only carrying revolvers and semi-automatic handguns. But these guys went in with full body armor and all kinds of fully automatic rifles that they had modified themselves. And they went on a 45 minute shooting spree, shooting all of these cops and wreaking havoc before both of them were eventually taken down. And in this situation, the bank was probably going to be fine because they obviously had insurance. Not to mention the cops came in and eliminated the threat and the bank tellers didn't have to deal with it. 
But if you're your own bank and basically you have to be your own security, then you're going to have to deal with both of these things. And I don't know if you guys are trained or if you have a whole bunch of weaponry that you're ready to defend your cryptocurrency with, but it actually might be a good idea to keep some of your cryptocurrency in one of these ETFs or maybe even in one of the exchanges. You got to be really careful about which exchange you use and you probably don't want to keep all of your eggs in one basket. So maybe you want to spread your funds out a little bit. But just think about if you only have all of your cryptocurrency in one cold storage wallet and then some guys come in like that and they either start hitting you in the head with a wrench until you give them your keys or they maybe even tunnel into your room like some bank robbers do. People get really creative when they go to rob banks. And there's a lot of people that are out there advocating for people to only do self-custody and not to trust exchanges. But I just think it's something that we all really need to consider because there's a lot of goons out there and people are going to get desperate if cryptocurrency is going to do what we expect it to because Bitcoin was really made to save us all from a collapse of the economic system and the US dollar, which would obviously bring civil unrest and a lot of danger. And just like the diamond hands mentality, I think this is something that could get a lot of people caught in a situation that they don't want to be because we just have to face the facts. Sometimes there's going to be a bear market and sometimes people are going to try to rob you. Maybe it's not going to happen in your life and hopefully it doesn't, but there's always the possibility. And if it does happen, are you going to be able to defend all of your cryptocurrency? And if they do take all of the cryptocurrency that you have in self custody, are you going to be left with nothing else? Anyway, I guess I'm kind of rambling, but I just wanted to bring this to you guys' attention because most people aren't going to talk about it. And I really think it's something important to consider, especially if we are headed into a world of economic turmoil and civil unrest like a lot of people think so. But either way, let me know in the comments, what do you guys think? Is that something to be concerned about? And do you self-custody your cryptocurrency? Do you think you can actually protect it? And do you think that other people should try to self-custody their own? Or should you maybe diversify a little bit and keep some money in ex exchange somewhere? kind of treating it like a bank because they can keep your assets safe in case you can't. Either way, thank you guys so much for watching and don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if I brought you value or made you think about something. But most importantly, don't forget to do only good every day and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.